Good morning. I'm very happy uh, to tell you what uh, we've been about in the past uh, year. So last winter, we started being uh, involved in the uh, preparation of standard operating procedures uh, in collaboration with uh, DANA. So we prepared protocols for sampling, for water filtration in the field and in the lab. And later on during the season, we also uh, prepared SOP for the preparation of sludge coming from drinking water treatment plants and biofilm samples. We were responsible for the optimization and validation of total nucleic acid extraction methods. And uh, we're in really good shape for the lake water protocols. We're actually just fine tuning the protocols at the moment. And uh, we'll be very soon ready to, uh, to test them on the drinking water samples. And in the future, we'll also be uh, involved in the optimization and preparation of sludge and biofilm uh, protocols. We are responsible for the preparation of, uh, ribosome of RNA libraries for metatranscriptomic analyses. And this work will be performed by our new postdoc, Sukri, who just joined our team uh, this week. So in the ATRAP project, we will be uh, characterizing DNA and RNA. Let's see if we can do the, the cursor. For the DNA, we'll be uh, doing some uh, 16S ribosomal RNA uh, amplicon sequencing and metagenomics. This uh, work will be uh, performed by uh, Jesse Shapiro's team. And we'll also be characterizing RNA for metatranscriptomic analyses to see whether the genes are turned on. The reason why we wanted to do, uh, extract both the DNA and the RNA at the same time was because uh, we wanted to reduce the uh, workload because the number of samples we have for this project is huge. And we wa wanted to also uh, reduce the cost. So we tested three different methods. The first method is a method that we currently use in our lab uh, to um, recover DNA from uh, samples that are contaminated with hydrocarbons. We also tested two different kits from Kyogen. The uh, winner was the second method uh, that generated the best quality DNA and RNA, but we had to go for the second best method because of logistics and uh, technical reasons. But uh, no worries, uh, this, uh, this RNAZ uh, power water kit is also generating very good um, quality DNA and RNA, so we're in good shape. So I was involved in the preparation of very detailed shopping list for the various teams. So with suppliers, catalog numbers, I also prepared detailed protocols that included materials and reagents section at the beginnings to help people uh, get organized because when you do RNA extraction, you uh, cannot afford uh, looking for things. You need to be uh, right on the point. I've also started training some uh, people from University of Montreal, from uh, Jeff Jesse's uh, team. And uh, in the very near future, when all the reagents and material is uh, available, I'll go to Polytechnique to train the, uh, the people there as well. A very important mandate of uh, NRC is the development of the, the, the droplet digital PCR method to detect various cyanotoxins as, and also genes that are used for other functions. And the preliminary, preliminary work uh, is humongous. Uh, in order to be able to develop this method. And uh, this work was performed by my colleague, Lucie Dupuis. And uh, what she first did is a literature review to find out uh, which primers were already available by, uh, and designed by a previous uh, uh, scientist. And after that, she went to GenBank to retrieve all of the sequences of genes of interest. So what you have in this slide here is, uh, for example, the first uh, paragraph is you have a, a very easy scenario where she was looking for the SXTA gene, which is part of the sexitoxin gene cluster. And in that particular case, it's a partial sequence. It's very easy to retrieve. She also had to retrieve every single gene from entire clusters, which is the, sec the second paragraph. And she also had to deal with complete genomes, which included millions of bases. So she had to go in the genomes and actually retrieve every single gene for each um, cyanotoxins that we were interested in. And after that, she regrouped every sequence for each gene. She regrouped them by genus. 
So once this work was done, that allowed my colleague, Alberto Maza, who is here as well today, to uh, start looking, validate the existing primers that were found in the literature, and also develop some primers, design some primers for um, targets that uh, we were interested in for specific genus. So this is our list of um, targets. We're very excited about this because uh, when you see the first column with all the yes, is this is where we have um, a very successful assay at the moment for various uh, cyanotoxins. And um, what you see on the other column on the right is uh, Alberto has been attempting to do multiplex um, assays. And we have a very good assay now that will allow us to detect cylindrospermopsin and anatoxin A at the same time. And we also have a very successful assay to, to um, monitor sexy toxin as well as the TATA naked DNA uh, fragment that we are actually spiking in our samples prior to DNA extraction. So this naked DNA fragment will allow us to normalize all of our DDD PCR results. So we're very uh, excited with uh, what came out of this. <laughs> We've seen this picture before. One of our really big challenge as well is to find positive controls. We're still struggling with, uh, with that, but we have a very nice little story, successful story to tell with the sexy tungsten. So uh, Christian uh, this summer provided us with some uh, Lingbia Wolli uh, mat, and uh, we ended up extracting the DNA from the dried extract that had been thor thoroughly cleaned. The mats had been thoroughly cleaned before drying, and we did the PCR amplification of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, a gene that is used for uh, identification purposes. And we just took a risk, we sequenced it. We wanted to know if it was a pure culture. And we were very excited when we saw the uh, sequencing profile that are extremely clean. So this is a really good indication that we're actually working with a pure culture. <laughs> so Alberto went on and uh, looked at uh, the the primers that were uh, already in the existing primers, which are labeled as uh, SXTA1 to 3. And he also designed some primers, um, the SXT10 uh, and 16, that are specific for Lingbia Wolli. And uh, this is the type of uh, work that we're doing when we want to uh, develop the assay, is we're testing different annealing temperature to see, um, to find the best um, amplification scenarios. And uh, we're very, very happy to see that when you look at the blue uh, droplets there, these are the droplets that contain the uh, CXTA gene. It's very well separated from the black droplets, which contain no targets. So this is the type of assay that we want to develop. develop. We have a very clear distinction between the two types of droplets. So again, we're uh, ready to test this assay with uh, DNA that are coming from environmental samples. We're also involved in the sampling activities, and our favorite lake um, is uh, Mississauga Bay in Lake Champlain, and it's part of the high intensity screening. So this is a picture of our boat launch uh, station this summer. And we have uh, five stations. So uh, we have three stations along the shore, and we have a station two that is more in the pelagic area. We also have a station on top at uh, Pike River, and Pike River is surrounded by agricultural lands. Our station one uh, station is uh, directly on top of the intake for uh, drinking water. So we've been sampling from April 12 until November 4th, every two weeks. And we had a persistent cyanobacterial bloom from August to October. And we had at least two episodes of spectacular concentration of E. coli and coliform in Pike River mouth. That was really worrisome because um, those uh, events could not be associated with rainfall because it hadn't rained for three weeks prior to this, uh, those episodes. <clears throat> this is just a snapshot of uh, nutrient concentration. So for different stations, I just put the lowest concentration and the highest concentration. So what you see in green with the red uh, character is uh, where the concentrations are extremely high if you look at Pike River mouth. What's interesting is you see that all the nitrogen Highest concentration were found on uh, June uh, 22nd, which is corresponding to the um, uh, application of manure and fertilizer on the, the lands. And um, what you see also, it's pretty disheartening when you see that your lowest concentration uh, are really, really high considering uh, the uh, criteria. So 
we have a perfect uh, scenario here for a bloom. These are some toxin concentrations. So on the upper left panel, you see intracellular microcystin. Uh, upper right, the extracellular microcystin. And at the bottom, you have the other cyanotoxins. So the concentrations are in nanogram per liter. And you can see that in the intracellular toxins, we had peaks in, both, uh, in our boat launch uh, site. Uh, at the end of August, and we also had a significant peak at the, um, in the Pike River mouth station in, at the end of September, you see that the extracellular toxins are mainly found uh, during the month of August. And we also detected some, some cylindrospermopsin in our Pike River mouth uh, station, and a little bit of anatoxin uh, as well in our station one, which is on top of the uh, intake for drinking water at the uh, mid-October. Lots of things happened in Champlain last year, and uh, an event that also was uh, really uh, exceptional is uh, we had a massive mussel die off in September. Hundreds and hundreds of uh, mussels were floating on the green water and without their shells. And we also noticed uh, at the, uh, in the fall and the, during the month of December, extreme accumulation of shells on the shore. And some, a lot of those shells were actually containing the dried uh, mussels. Um, we uh, informed the government uh, about this event, and uh, the Ministère des Ressources Naturelles has been extremely proactive trying to identify the species that uh, were, died, died, and uh, also trying to find out the cause of these uh, massive die-off. Die so this work could not have been done this year without all of these wonderful people, and uh, so I just wanted to, uh, to thank uh, them. And I've been sampling Mississippi Bay since uh, 2006, and it's actually the first time that I get a picture of all of us in the boat. So uh, I was really excited about that. I wanted to share it with you. So this is my Alberto that is um, near the motor, and uh, the other person is Miria. So this is uh, my basic uh, sampling uh, partners, my sampling team. So this is it. Thank you. Nathalie, super présentation. Euh, les valeurs de toxines intracellulaires, il y en a qui sont vraiment assez faibles. Est-ce que c'était plus faible que ce à quoi on s'attend normalement sur la baie de Missisquoi? Puisqu'on parle de concentration maximale autour de 100 nanogrammes par litre, puis euh, anatoxine détectée, mais j'ai bien Très lu faible. un nanogramme par litre. C'était 19, 19, oh, 19 nanogrammes okay. par, euh, par litre pour l'anatoxine. Oui. Euh, oui, moi, je remarque que depuis plusieurs années, là, la concentration des toxines elle, semble diminuer. Ah oui. Euh, par rapport à quand on échantillonnait en 2006 euh, jusqu'à 2012, là, on avait des concentrations beaucoup plus élevées. On parlait des microgrammes par litre. Je remarque qu'avec les années, euh, c'est moins élevé. Est-ce qu'il y a quelque Mais, chose à faire avec le protocole que vous utilisez pour euh, euh, faire les, je suppose, le cell bound, c'est justement ce qu'on discutait tout à l'heure, au niveau de la méthodologie, pour s'assurer qu'on va chercher toutes les toxines sur l'extrait, sur les cellules lysées, finalement? Euh, là, tu parles, tu parles pour les, les... Oui, pour les toxines. C'est du point 45 qu'on utilise, oui, Audrey. Puis après ça, parce que c'est ça, c'est vraiment ouais. intéressant de voir que c'est quand même, c'est systématique, mais c'est beaucoup ouais. plus faible, moins un ordre de grandeur plus faible que ce, ce que je me serais attendu à, ouais. à voir. On a fait au début de la saison euh, les analyses sur du point 2 micron, pour les cyanotoxines, mais ça prenait des heures et des heures à, à filtrer, ça n'avait aucun bon sens. Mais euh, c'est au point 45 déjà, mais c'est possible qu'on manque, euh, qu on, qu on, qu on manque quelque chose qui passe à travers le filtre, là, ça c'est sûr. Mais là, ça, on est toujours euh, au jongle avec la logistique, hein, le, le temps que ça prend pour faire les filtrations. Puis, euh... Merci, Nathalie.